about the uh, the panel. Um, so on house three, well, house one, two, and three. Uh, house, houses one and two were two layers of three quarter inch laminated, so a total wall thickness of inch and a half. Wall and house three, it was just one layer of inch and an eighth. That was the first time we moved to the the large format panels that we're using now, and and then where the panels butted together, we we used a batten or you know like just a connector strip. So I bring that up because engineering wise. Uh, the, the engineer that, that worked on those houses was fine with the values that they came up with for a single panel wall assembly. Um, we moved to a double wall assembly as a uh, sort of a, um, let's try this and see what happens, and we had some extra panels that we had to use up. And from there, that just became the norm, right? Um, so. We know that that house three with a single panel is still standing. I mean, it was built in 2004, 2005 is when it was finished. Um, it's still there. It hasn't, hasn't fallen down, hasn't you know, had any major deflection. So we just need to get to a place where we can actually prove that, right? Uh, the other thing we want to note about OSB, sort of one of the pieces that OSB has that is often uh, an issue, and one of the things we run into a lot is this perception issue that you're building with OSB. OSB is an inferior product, and OSB is going to have all these problems if it gets wet, you know, blah, blah, blah. So we talked a little bit about this idea that the recipe that we're using has water resistance to it. And so, you know, it, it getting wet is only going to happen during the construction process. The other thing is, is to note that once we're done building the house and the control layers are up, that structure, that material is inside all the time. So it's in a really controlled environment. In terms of humidity levels and temperature fluctuation, where most structures that we see live half, you know, one foot outside, one foot inside, where it's touching cold and touching hot, and it does a lot of movement. We're just used to that. You know, when we build a house, we do a 12-month walkthrough, and we go through and fix screw pops. And we fix screw pops because the wood got wet and it's dried, and now it's sort of reaching this place. But we just accept that as um, that's just what happens. But it actually happens because we 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 make the structure do that. When we move the structure indoors and keep it indoors, we don't have to worry about the things that typically worry people when OSB gets wet. One of the things that we do want to pay a lot of attention to is that in the name oriented strand board, it has an orientation. It's stronger in one direction than the other. And when it gets wet, if it gets wet, you'll get expansion, lateral expansion. The panel will grow, right? And so if you ever see when you roof uh, or sheathe any sort of structure, they ask you to gap the sheathing. You know, you, you used to, we used to, when we frame, stick an eight-penny nail in there to, to gap it. Nobody really does that as often, but the, the reason for that is that it, it gives you some room to, for the panel to grow so they won't buckle, right, when you get lateral expansion. And one of the big concerns that we've had with the OSB structure is what happens if the OSB wall decides to grow laterally through expansion and it, and it buckles, right? And so one of the things that we're currently doing and working through is that we cross laminated them so that the orientation runs perpendicular to each other. Um, and that way then what we're running into is, um, is, is structural resistance to that, to that expansion. So, uh, Panel handling, um, the big thing about this product is you can't run to the box store and pick up an, a couple extra sheets when you run out. Um, the, the vehicle that you would need to, to carry that's big, and, and um, the, the lifting of it is, is complicated. As we mentioned, they're 860 pound panels. Um, so, what we need to uh, move these panels around is a, is a, is a crane, basically a boom truck. Uh, generally, we like to see that boom truck with 160 foot reach um, because they're going to be parked out on the curb. So, most of the crane companies in town have boom trucks, that their, their smallest boom truck is that length. Um, there's two main lifting pieces we have to deal with. Um, when they're reaching to 160 feet, you're only moving 860 pounds at most. So it's a very small load for a crane like that. Um, the biggest thing is that when the truck shows up the morning of crane day, uh, we have to lift very quickly, uh, or as quickly as we can, uh, the load off the truck. And so this is where we're moving the largest weights. Um, 
the whole whole house will come on one load. It'll be about 27,000 pounds. We don't typically offload it in one lift. And I'll show you a video of the offloading uh, coming up here where uh, we actually move it in five panel um, increments. Uh, but that's sort of the requirements of the crane. And generally speaking, once the panels are stacked and they're laying in front of you, um, they have, you have the ability to grab a corner and kind of lift it. And if you just kind of shake it, put a little cushion of air under it, you can get it to kind of slide a little bit. And so you'll you sort of the, 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 the folks in the field that are be handling these panels will start to see some of the tricks to moving those things around, utilizing their surface area actually uh, provides some uh, mobilization for them. But Generally speaking, we want to handle them all quickly in a very short period of time because we have to use expensive equipment and they're big and they move, but once they're in place, they're not going anywhere. So, um, fasteners and glue. <clears throat> so all the panels at this point are being both glued and mechanically fastened together to, for the lamination and, um, and just mechanically fastened for the connections. Um, the glue that we're using is, a, is a basically like a subfloor adhesive or a PL. Uh, liquid nails type um, product. Um, we have uh, specified for the panel lamination a, uh, a pneumatically driven ring shank nail um, with a particular screwing pattern that can put those together. That pattern is on the structural page. You'll see um, a pattern for screws and you'll see a pattern for nails. The screws are obviously a lot more expensive, a lot more labor intensive, but we now have uh, the engineering thanks to Kurt to get a, a nail pattern that's much easier to put into place with a, a pneumatic fastener. Um, the, uh, and the fasteners that we're using, we're, we're slowly backing off on sort of their structural requirements where we used to use really high-end fasteners like GRK brand fasteners for their structural um, capacity. Have, we've now moved back on some of our fastener schedules so that our fastener package isn't as, quite as expensive. We don't have quite as many fasteners involved, but we still use um, as a sort of a, 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 a tool that the carpenters will use is the, the 5 16 inch structural screw because it also acts as a clamp, right? You can, you can move panels around with that screw. You can clamp them. You can use uh, kickers and, and wedge bars to be screwed together to kind of lift and move panels around. And so we kind of use that screw as a tool, not necessarily as a permanent fastener all the time. Um, the exterior walls, like we mentioned, all of the exterior walls on the structure are all made out of uh, the, this OSB that we're talking about. Um, we'll start moving into some of the photos of the, of the framing. Can you still call it framing, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> It's a frame. So it's a great idea. It's not a frame. Panel assembly? No, it's not. It's a the paneling. It's a box. The box. Oh, wait a minute. I put this on here. Steve, for the adhesive, uh, when you're doing the cross laminating, is there a certain spacing or pattern of that you guys have figured out, or is it in line yeah. with the nailing? Yeah, so you're talking for the glue? Yeah. Yeah, so we did this, uh, this is this testing that we did, mm -hmm. where we did this uh, layout to try to figure out what our spread is. Um, so what we're looking for are these, what were they, quarter inch, Kirk? Quarter yeah. inch beads? Yep. So a quarter inch wide bead um, laid out. Roughly a quarter of an inch. Um, when we press that together, it would get us a spread somewhere between three and four inches. And so we use that information um, to inform us to sort of what that what that layout would be. Um, Just to be clear, the pictures you're looking at, there's a screw kind of a foot to the right and a foot to the left. So there's no screw right in line with the adhesive. Screw there, and a screw there. In the pattern, it is good to have that, but we're seeing what we could do when it's beyond the screw. And then we basically tried to try to break once we glue this together, try to break that, and so the material was failing, not the not the um, sure. the glue. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. I have a. the 
part of this uh, presentation that I'm wishing I had the photos into the PowerPoint. Uh, eventually, I had, I had a picture of the of the of the layout of the of the um, of the fasteners, but we. We, we don't have on the drawing curt specified an actual layout of the glue. Or is the glue the same as the... Uh, we do see it now. So we yeah, have to pull up a maple or cedar, it should be on there. Okay, so it is on there. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know if you have that handy, if you want to pull that up while I'm going through the next panel. Um, so let's get to the framing of the walls here. And we'll talk about one of the things that is a, is a little bit of a challenge with with these smaller lots and with the panel sizing and the timing and the crane is site management becomes a challenge. Um, getting a lot of things dropped off and delivered and timing that out throughout the day and utilizing the crane. So the crane sort of presents a problem in that we want to have the crane there the least amount of time as possible because it's the most expensive employee we'll have. But at the same time, the crane has the ability and gives us the ability to go vertically in our organization on the uh, storage of materials. So we can stack things up that we normally wouldn't be able to stack up with just um, a delivery truck coming and you know doing a back end roll off of the lumber stack. We can actually just have the truck pull up next to the crane, the crane can go over, pick it off the truck and set it over and we can stack up vertically a lot of our components and then have the ability to move that around. Uh, but site management becomes, uh, you know, a challenge. This this is the the trust the floor trust package for cedar, in terms of how much space it takes up. Um, so the first the first step in um, in the framing process here and getting this this framing moving is the plates. So when you're on day one. And, and I'll have for you guys a, uh, uh, an actual uh, document that you can have that lists out all of these sequence steps. Uh, but the, the first step that you guys are going to do is, is lay out this, this plates. And the plates um, are, are a two plate system that provide a, a receiver for the panels to sit in. And so the first plate, as you see, is a, is a green treated 2x6. And the green treated 2x6 goes flush to the outside dimensions of the, of the panel wall, okay? And so if this building frame sits at 24 feet wide, the outside of those plates will sit at 24 feet. So this gets down to starting to identify how you snap the lines, lay that thing out in conjunction with the accuracy of your concrete contractor, right? Um, what happens if your concrete contractor is a little bit wide is different than what happens if they're a little bit narrow. We have some tolerance and you kind of have to do what you normally do on a new house to lay that thing out as square as you can and center it on its overhangs. And then if you have any wall that is wider than the dimension where it's going to stick out proud, we'll probably have to make that call on site whether we want to split the difference and put that on two sides or if we want to move it all to one side and if we're going to have to wedge some of that off. But generally speaking, you're going to lay that plate out to your outside dimensions. And then once that plate is, is set, then you can snap your line an inch and an eighth in and set your second plate. Now, the pictures you see here um, demonstrate a J-bolt that was set into the foundation. And as you can see, the J-bolt wasn't set tall enough. Um, and in one of those previous pictures you saw when it was bent over. And we, we found that, generally speaking, uh, the concrete folks don't do a great job of setting those bolts up for us. And we're also doing this double plate thing that makes it a lot more difficult to get accurate because you're going to set your first plate down and you want it to be static so that you can snap your lines for your second plate. But your, your first plate, then you'd require to screw that thing down, snap your lines, and then unbolt it and put the second plate down. It's just a lot of monkeying. We found it to be a lot quicker to just skip the J-bolts in the concrete. Um, come out and be able to snap your lines, use a powder actuated nailer to just tack that first plate down. 
so that it's, it's, it's held there, it's not permanent, but it's held in place. You can then nail your second plate on top, and now you're, you're located your plates and you're in the position you want, and then we'll come in after the fact and we'll use a hammer drill to drill in um, our fasteners. And so the fastener that uh, we've currently spec'd out is a, is a Simpson Titan HD. It's a six, uh, six and a half inch yep. um, that just gets ratcheted down. Okay. So the inspectors are okay with that? Yeah, we'll have a, a letter, a structural letter for that. Yep. And so you, and you, you'll find it'll go, it'll go a lot quicker than, oh, yeah. than monkeying around with trying to get these bolts to work. Um, generally, we found that at least three of the bolts were sitting underneath trusses. Um, we had to insert four or five bolts anyways because you need a bolt within 12 inches of the splice of all of the plates. Um, we ended up doing so much monkey and with redoing that, uh, the, the, the bolt layout that we just moved to not doing those at all and, and inserting them all after the fact. Any questions on that? So once the plate's set, your next step is to set your floor trusses. Um, what you're seeing here is a mid-cord bearing truss. Um, the current cedar design uh, that we're doing in this round are all bottom cord bearing trusses. So you won't see this detail. And it actually, other than raising the elevation of the first floor up and changing you know, the approach with an extra step, um, it actually solves a bunch of problems in terms of uh, like the basement windows and the, um, you know, the clearance of that ceiling. Um, but this, this uh, truss layout is pretty straightforward. In terms of sequencing, this truss layout is going to have two, uh, two long trusses that will sam uh, uh, sandwich basically the stairwell. And um, let's see if I can find that guy. I've got that layout pattern you can show it on the document. Yes, this is a technology. Yeah, I'll have to do a little juggling. It's always hard to get a spot. 